So um, what we will be doing for this session and the next, we will be focusing on microeconomics, sorry, macroeconomics. So basically what we covered in term one and a bit of information with regards to what else for the next term will be covered in term three, which are paper one macroeconomic topics. I believe everyone um, received the learner workbook from the department, so that is what we will be working through. Um, the structure of the session will be as follows. We will, I'll take you through a breakdown of the structure of the economics papers, what you can expect, the specific topics, as well as looking at how to answer these questions, and then we'll work through some question and answer session, um, tips and some tips, hints and tips for you to make a success um, of the subject. So, so basically, for the final exam, your economics um, question paper will consist of two, you will write in two papers, paper one and paper two, and a lot of the learners are not sure as to what goes into which paper. So we will be looking through the topics for paper one specifically now. Right on the screen, as you can see, paper one, each paper will carry a marking total of 150 marks. You will have two hours to complete the papers. So for paper one, these are the main topics that um, we'll be focusing on. So what we have covered before in term one is the macroeconomic section. And these are also the four topics that we will be covering during today's session and Thursday session. So the topics, subtopics included is circular flow, business cycles, the public sector, foreign exchange markets. Now, if you have a look at economic pursuits, which is what um, we will be covering when we go back to schools now for the third term, Protectionism and free trade has been highlighted. Please take note and also make a note on your booklet that this topic was previously might have been taught in term one, the macroeconomics, but it's now been moved to term three to economic pursuits. Okay? But it will still be included in paper one. So for economic pursuits, we will be doing protectionism and free trade, growth and development, industrial development policies, as well as economic and social performance indicators. Paper two, what you have, um, have covered now in the second term, microeconomics. So we will look at perfect and imperfect markets. So perfect markets, imperfect markets, monopolies, oligopolies, monopolistic competition, as well as market failures. What goes hand in hand with microeconomics are contemporary economic issues. And these are the subtopics included there inflation, tourism, environmental sustainability. So this will be paper two, and as you can see, also 150 marks, and two hours you will be writing that. I've just covered all of these. Also, each paper comprises of six questions, but these six questions are divided into three um, sections. And I will look at exactly how you ought to answer the question, because some of you, um, you might give too many answers or indecisive or leave certain things blank. So we will get some hints and tips for you to follow. So the format of your paper. Of the six questions, only four in total must be answered and you will answer these as follow. Section A, question one, is compulsory. This means you have to answer all the questions. If you are not sure of an answer, it's I compared, I always tell my learners it's similar to playing the lotto. So you take a guess, but you do not leave it blank. Okay? Then you will have section B. This will consist of three questions, questions two through to four. And of those, you as a candidate must only choose two questions. Now, a lot of my learners make this mistake. They answer all three of these questions, meaning question two, question three, and question four. But only the first two questions will be marked. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Then the um, section C, which is the last section, there will be two essay questions for each paper. So two questions in paper one and two essay questions in paper two. You must only choose one per paper. So you will answer one essay in paper one and one essay in paper two. 
If you do or answer both of these questions, only one question will be marked. And obviously the first one will be marked. Okay? Very important learners, um, you have to read your instructions carefully and follow your instructions. So the following is very important. We read our instructions on the cover page thoroughly. You lose marks when you don't adhere to instructions. So for example, you were asked, um, you have to graphically illustrate something, you have to draw a graph. There are certain rules that you need to follow as well. We, we say use black pen, black or blue ink, and then you do it in pencil, or you did something incorrectly and you don't draw a line through it. How does the marker know what to mark? Okay? Read your instructions to every question carefully because it will tell you exactly what is expected of you. Then, with regards to your numbering, please number your answers in accordance with the numbering system that is used in the question paper. So many of the learners tend to lose marks in their test and examinations because of incorrect numbering. Your answer might be correct, but when it is written against the wrong number, then it is marked incorrectly, okay? So we have to take note of that as well. Here are your instructions to the question paper, what you should be doing. Write only with a blue and or black pen. Do not write in pencil. Any answers in pencil will be regarded as an examination irregularity, sorry about that, um, meaning it will not be marked, okay, it will be marked incorrectly. Use your pencil only to draw graphs or sketches, for example, and then, but your labels for your graph has to be pen as well. So, your examination guidelines for the 2021 exam is very important. Um, do you have a copy of the examination guidelines? Have you received it from your teachers? Um, what would help is that you have that examination guideline because it will guide you as to what to focus on, um, what would be possible essay questions, etc. So you do not have this in your booklet, but you will see at the back, at the end of the um, question paper, sorry, the workbook, that there is a section where we actually put out for you guys um, for each topic, the examination questions pertaining to section C. So let's just have a brief look at what this document looks like. Sorry, the examination guidelines. So basically what I would set out is, so you'll see at the top it says macroeconomics. Your topic is in the first column and in the second column it basically explains. Now, my tip to you would be where you see it says discuss in detail like it's highlighted here. That would normally tell you that this is an essay question. Where if it says discuss in detail, okay? So for example, markets within the circular flow, that is an essay question. So it says discuss in details the markets within the four sector model. So if you do have the examination guidelines, um, those are the types of pointers or things you could look at to give you guidance as to what are essay questions and what not, okay? So the 2021 examination guidelines is a very important document and it guides us as to what to learn and how to prepare ourselves for tests and examinations. So it will be good practice to keep the document with you every day and when you are studying. So the following essays were identified um, for the examination guidelines. As I said previously, all topics where you see the words discuss in detail, or examine in detail, compare and contrast in detail, where those words appear, this should be regarded as essay questions or essay topics for the next three-year cycle. Um, I've mentioned this before. This is what the four topics we will be concentrating on now for today's session and Thursday's session. So what will we follow now is we are going to look at the various sections, we'll start off with section A now, which I previously said is compulsory. So now we will look at how do I answer these section A questions. So these questions are compulsory and must be completed by all candidates. A tip with regards to section A is you will fare better, score more marks, if you know your definitions or your concepts and things like that. Okay. So it's important that you know your economic concepts, your terminology, and all your definitions or descriptions. Attempt 
an answer for all the questions, even if you're not sure about the answer or don't know the answer. If you are uncertain, continue with your examination and then you can return to those questions when you have finished answering the question paper. So you, otherwise you are going to waste your time. You have to utilize your two hours to obtain maximum marks. Okay, so don't get stuck on a question. If you don't know the answer, move on answer what you do know, and then you can return with the time that's, that you have left over. Also, important to note, it may be that you can find clues for the unanswered questions as you proceed with the exam or the test. But also remember to leave lines open for the unanswered questions, okay? If you do not know the answer, they can educate the guess. Also important to know, if you leave questions unanswered, you will not get any marks for that. However, if you write an answer which makes economic sense and answers the question, you can be awarded marks. So, what this means is, it won't always be a textbook answer, you know, where you quote word for word what you have studied, but you have the basic understanding of it. If it makes economic sense, you will be awarded the answer or the marks. So, question one in section A is normally multiple choice. So, various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions, and then you choose your answer and write only the letter A to D, A to D next to the question number in your answer. So, how do I go about answering multiple question, multiple choice questions? First of all, you read the question or statement thoroughly before attempting to answer. There are four options provided as possible answers to the statement or to the question, and it's expected of you as a learner to choose only one possible answer, and you only write down the letter next to the question number. Okay? Only one option or possible answer per question will be accepted. If more than one option or answer is written, both will be marked as incorrect. So, um, now you are not sure, it sounds like the answer could be A or B, so you write A slash B. Both of them will be marked incorrect. So what we're going to do now is, in your booklet, your workbook, you have this work, um, these questions with you. If you can turn to page number five, there are seven multiple choice questions over there. Um, we will read through the questions and you can see that certain words have been put in bold. And that is for you to, um, to know what to focus on. This is actually what we are asking. Okay? So um, I'm going to give you a minute or two to answer these questions and then we'll go through the answers together. What you can do is, um, you could just circle the correct answer on your, in your booklet, in the workbook. If you have any questions, feel free to um, ask questions. I'll answer any questions from you. Thank you. 
Kretuan by for in the interest of um, saving time. Most of you should have come finished most of these questions. So what we will do, I will go through each one with you and then you should mark. Remember, you are allocated two marks per multiple choice question. So when you do mark yours, um, allocate two marks for your correct answer. Okay, so question 1.1.1. So earnings received from the export of goods and services, so it's basically what businesses or what a private individual earns from exporting when they trade with um, other countries, what do we call that? The way you could answer these questions as well is if you look at each specific answer and see by process of elimination, so if I'm asking myself money, if I'm receiving earnings for the sale of goods and services, could it be considered a leakage? For me to be able to say yes or no, I would know what a leakage is. Leakage is when money is leaving the circular flow. So A is already eliminated. Um, earnings received is money coming into the circular flow. So basically that is an injection that we are receiving. So the answer here would be B. Okay say an injection into the circular flow, money that your fact of production is earning or that a business is earning for the sale of their goods and services. Question 1.1.2, a focus on the improvement of input efficiency is a characteristic of which type of policy? So the improvement of input now, input efficiency, we are referring to your raw materials, your factors of production that firms use to manufacture goods and services. So if we are looking at, the, the, at firms specifically or businesses, we are looking at the supply side of the economy. So your answer there would be D. Question 1.1.3. Goods which are regarded as socially harmful. So if it's deemed bad for society, these are known as merit goods. So any goods that are um, deemed good for society, or yes, sorry, goods that are deemed good for society would be called merit goods. However, if they are deemed as socially harmful, so it's not good, for communities, it's not good for the citizens of a country or it's seen as having um, harmful effects on society. The opposite of merit would be demerit goods. So the answer there would be B. Question 1.1.4. Countries with fundamental balance of payment problems can apply for financial support from who? So the country is having a bit of problems with their balance of payment, um, have a de deficit, you know, a shortage of cash, can't fund um, public functions, spending functions, etc. You, the country would make a loan or borrow money funds from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which is option A. I'm going to move past the questions and go to the section with just the answers so that you can just tick off and mark, remember, two marks allocated for a correct answer. So, question 1.1.1 was B, injections. Number two is supply side. Number three, demerit. Number 1.1.4, international monetary fund. And number five, C, deficit. Number six, D, comparative. And number seven, again, the international monetary fund. Please just double check your answers and tick off two marks per question. So let's say, for example, in your exams, you would have eight of these questions in the final exam. If you got all eight correct, that is already that gives you 16 marks. So it's eight times two, you would have already had 16 for this first section. The second question you will find in section A would be matching the columns. So you would have a description in one column and, sorry, a term in the one column and a description in the other column and you would need to match these up. So you learners are expected to provide a description in column B next to the term in column A. Only one choice or option 
is acceptable term. So you can't go and write A or F. So only the one choice and only that one will be marked if you answer one. If two answers are chosen, both will be marked as incorrect. So the instruction will always read as follow. Choose a description from column B that matches an item in column A. Write only the letter A to I next to the question number. So this is an example of what it would look like. So column A has your um, concept or term and column B has the definitions. You read through the definition and see which one goes with which. So I'll give you two, three minutes to go through this. I know you guys might be a bit rusty, seeing as that is term one um, work. So we are basically, it's not about testing you at the moment, it's just to give you some practice as to how you would answer these questions. Okay, so the terms we are using here in column A, um, I'm going to read them out to you. This equilibrium, what does that mean? If an economy is not in equilibrium, so the conditions or the criteria for equilibrium is when leakages are equal to injections. We say that equilibrium or the economy is in equilibrium. So obviously, this equilibrium will be the opposite of that where leakages are more than injections, or injections are more than leakages, exceed one another. Then an economy would be in disequilibrium. Then I go and look for the option in the column, right, in column B, that speaks about leakages and injections where one exceeds the other. So if we have a look over here, in column B, option D, when leakages are more than injections, so that would be your answer for question 1.2.1. I'll give you two minutes to complete the rest and then display the answers for you on the screen. Okay, let's just have a look at this. So, this equilibrium, we've covered that one already. The marginal propensity to consume. So, here we are talking about, when we're looking at the topic of the multiplier. Marginal propensity, so it's basically the likelihood or the spending patterns of consumers. How much of the money do they spend in the economy, right? So, that's basically we want to know what portion of income do consumers or households spend. So, if you know the definitions, so the definitions are very important. If I know my definitions, I will have um, a better understanding of what is required of me. So, let's have a look at the answers. So, the equilibrium, as we said, the option D, the marginal propensity to consume is F. The system of national accounts, A, the repo rate, option B, and depreciation, option C, and the last one, terms of trade, the answer is E. Each one of these are allocated one correct mark, or one mark per answer. So it will be six multiplied by one. If you scored all of these correctly, so there will be an additional six marks. Okay, so section A is a total of 30 marks. So with 
Question 1.1, which was the multiple choice, you had eight questions there, that's 16 marks you can score. Then question 1.1.2, which is matching columns, six marks. So now you could have had a total of 24 for section A already. Question 1.3, which we find is even at school level, from grade 10 onwards up to grade 12, in control test and exam, um, learners tend to leave this blank. And I would say the sole reason for this is if you do not know your descriptions or definitions. So in question 1.3, you have to give one term for each of the following descriptions. So you are given a definition and you must say what it is. So the learners may not provide answers in the form of abbreviations, acronyms and examples. You have to give a term, the terminology for the description. So if you, are, if, you, if you give an abbreviation, an acronym, or an example for this, this question in the test examination, you will forfeit the marks, meaning that you will lose on, out on that mark, it will be marked incorrectly. So the instruction would typically read, give one term for each of the following descriptions, and you write only the term next to the question number. So if it's question number 1.3.1, and the term in your answer book, okay? So we're gonna look at some examples of this. Now, question 1.3, we read the definition and then we have to give a term for it. So the process whereby a relatively small change in injections results in a proportionally larger increase in national income. What is the term for that? So there's this um, concept that we did in term one, which is called the multiplier. So the multiplier basically is, we are saying that if there's a small injection of money into an economy, this will result in a proportionately larger increase in national income, meaning all citizens or all factors of production will earn a larger income as a result of money being injected into the economy. 1.3.2, Money paid by the government to a person or institution without any counter-performance. Now, this wording could also be without any, um, let's say, not having to perform a service or rendering labor in exchange. What do we call this type of payment? So, this is called a transfer payment. So basically what we, we refer to an example, just to give you an idea, an example of a transfer payment would, for example, be um, the grant payouts that the government gives citizens okay, in South Africa. That is an example of a transfer payment. Question 1.3.3. It measures the distance between the peak and the trough of a business cycle. So you have your business cycle. We know we have our expansionary phases and our um, contractionary phases. So between one peak to the next peak, how does one measure the distance on that business cycle? And thus we call the amplitude. So the answer for 1.3.3 is amplitude. 1.3.4. So whatever the concept is they want you to um, give us an answer, illustrates or shows us the relationship between unemployment and inflation. There's a name for that sp specific graph. So this is a graph we are referring to, and um, the graph that shows us the relationship between unemployment and inflation, that is the Phillips curve. 1.3.5, a curve that shows the relationship between tax rates and taxable income would be the Laffer curve. So I'll um, display the answers in a second so that you can see the spelling as well. 1.3.6, a form of credit from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which can be used when balance of payment difficulties are experienced. So when a country is experiencing balance of payment um, difficulties, there's a special provision there that um, the IMF affords a country, and this is what we call special drawing rights. Correct 12, what I also want to emphasize or bring home to you is that Section A 
will be a combination of questions from all topics covered in paper one. So it will be um, business cycles, the circular flow, um, international trade, and also the term three topics, inflation, sustainability, um, sorry, economic and um, social indicators and all of the regional development and things like that. So section A will cover all the subtopics of paper one. So it won't just be term one work, it's basically term one and term three work and a combination of all of that will be covered in paper one in section A, okay? So now we're going to move on to section B. And here it's been shown in the past that learners tend to score lower marks with section B questions with the data responses where you get. This is the section where you get, um, for example, a cartoon, maybe a case study, an extract to read, and you have to answer questions, not necessarily based on the extract or based on the article, um, but it gives you an indication of what type or the topic that this question will be about, okay? So section B, there are three questions given in the paper. You have to answer two. Each of these questions are of a total of 40 marks, right? So it's question two, question three, or question four. So if you opt to do or to answer question two and question three, that means 40 marks for question two, 40 marks for question three, which gives you a total of 80 marks, okay? So, candidates are given three questions of which they must only answer two. If you answer all three questions in this section, only the first two questions will be marked. Now, um, I just need to point this out. So, you started answering question two, and now you realize that I don't know too much or I'm not comfortable. Um, I can't answer all the questions in question two. So now, Halfway through question two, you start answering question three. Right? You do it but better there, you answer more questions. And now you go on to question four. And in question four, you do really well, you know almost all the answers, quite confident in your ability to answer question four. Great well, you've not drawn a line through question two. So question two and question three will be marked. And in question four, in which you maybe um, would have scored the majority of your marks or more marks, you lose out on those marks, okay? So please, if you answer too many questions or more than the two questions in the section, draw a line through the question that you don't want the markers to mark, okay? So question two that you maybe not hadn't answered too well, draw a line through it because this will indicate that you don't want them this to be marked. Okay, so like it says here, the last point, when you answer more than two questions in the section, a red line will be, drawing through, will be drawn through the excess answers and the words too many questions will be written at the excess question. So, the way section B is structured, um, let's say question two. So, you will have a question, question 2.1, in question two, question three will be 3.1, and question four will be 4.1. So these will be the first two questions in the section, each worth two marks. Your mark allocation is also very important. So you're going to answer, the instruction will say, answer the following questions. Questions 2.1.1, 3.1.1, and 4.1.1. Remember, you are only answering two questions in the section. These questions will normally be the questions um, where you are asked to list things or to name things, okay? So here you can write the answers in bullet format. So list two injections, two examples of injections, right? So those um, are the types of questions you will be asked here. So these are some examples of how question 2.1.1 3.1.1 and 4.1.1 would be answered. Um, sorry, examined. So, give two examples of leakages. Please take note of the mark allocation over here. Do you see that it says two times one 
is your final mark of two. This means the first number indicates how many answers you are supposed to give. So if it says two multiplied by one, it means we need two answers and each will be allocated one mark. Okay? So two answers, each answer worth one mark and the final allocation will be two marks. Name two types of business cycles. So you just have to name to list. Um, yeah, so all of them are basically, it would say name, list, or give. So you just give the terms, okay? And important, like I said, the mark allocation, two multiplied by one, means we want two things from you, and each of them counts one mark. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the questions, but for example, the first two, give two examples of leakages. So what is a leakage? A leakage is when money leaves the circular flow. So what would be examples of those? When I pay tax on my income, income tax, that is money that is leave, that, is, that makes my disposable income less. Okay? So it means I won't be able to spend that money in the economy. So taxes or taxation is an example of a leakage. Um, when you save, so you put money into a fixed investment or, um, you know, saving for unforeseen circumstances, etc. It's money that's not being immediately spent in the circular flow, so this is also considered as a leakage. Then we have imports. So when we are importing goods and services from the foreign sector, from a different country, it means we have to pay for these goods and services and then money is leaving the circular flow or the money is leaving South Africa's circular flow, leaving the economy. So those are your three types of leakages, your three types, taxes, imports and savings. However, the answer or the question requires you to only give two answers. Okay. Um, question second one, sorry, question two, name two types of business cycles. So you, you will find there are four business cycles. Let me just go to the next slide. So for example, name two types of business cycles. So when we mark, we will have all possible answers there, but you are only required to give two answers. So any two of these types of business cycles, kitchen business cycles, juggler, juggler business cycle, Kuznet cycles, and contrative cycles. Okay, so any of those two. And um, these are just the, the rest of the questions and the possible answers. Then the second question after that will also be worth two marks, however, you'll see that there's a difference between the mark allocate or how the marks are allocated. So questions 2.1.2, 3.1.2, and 4.1.2, these questions will be explained. Um, then also what, what would be the impact or what would be the effect of something and why type of questions. The answers to these questions must be written in full sentences. And these types of questions are applicable to the above I've already mentioned, 2.1.2, 3.1.2, and 4.1.2. So let's have a look. Look at the mark allocation. So question number one reads, why is the GDP at market prices normally higher than the GDP at factor cost? So it's still two um, Yes. yes. There is just a, a, a comment, a question to ask you to allow a little bit more time for the learners to answer the questions. Okay, okay. thank you, noted. Apologies about that. Um, so, the first question over here, why is the GDP at market prices normally higher than the GDP at factor cost? So the mark allocation is 1 times 2. This means that you are only required to give one answer. However, this answer would not normally be a full sentence or a fact. So for each fact you give, you are awarded two marks. Okay? So you will note that with the previous question, the mark allocation was two times one. That means um, 
Two answers give name or list, each one allocated one mark. With this mark allocation here, it's one times two, meaning it's one fact or one question, or sorry, one statement that you give, and you will be awarded two marks. Okay? So. Okay. Um, sorry, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I had two hands now, and then the two hands disappeared again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yes, there's a question or there's a comment from Masi Bambani. Hi, to ask you to just go a little bit slower. Oh, and, okay. Yes, and then there's another comment from Mr. Green who's asking that you must maybe allow the, the learners to attempt the questions instead of just giving them the answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what we'll do now is, um, so there are seven questions on the screen. So we will, let's, let's do the first two. I'll give you guys um, an opportunity to try and answer the first two questions. And um, the rest you could use in your own time, you know, for revision purposes and to prepare for the exams. Um, all these answers you will find in your textbooks, in the WCD lesson plans that are made available to you guys, as well as your core notes. So just for the, um, for the sake of time, the first two questions, um, then we'll go through and look at, look at some possible answers from your side, from you as a learners, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, ma'am. So just uh, on an organizational note, um, mm -hmm. If you want to ask a question from the school side, you can just click on the raise the hand and then I will acknowledge it and then we can, from our side, allow you to unmute your microphone. I see yes, Senator Jungo uh, left a comment uh, addressing me as Miss Aifert. <laughs> we missed everything from question 2.1.1. So if you could maybe have a look at that. Okay, question 2.1.1. Correct. So, okay. Um, could I ask, do they mean my whole explanation as to how to answer it, or are they just referring to the, to the specific answers for those questions? Uh, Senator Jongo, ECO 12B2, I mm -hmm. am going to allow you to unmute your microphone and, oh, just the answers, there the comment came, okay. just the answers. Just the answers. Okay, so um, basically, what I did was I just showed the answers for the first two, so I'll go back to that. Okay. So the first question was to give any two examples of leakages. As I said, all possible answers are um, given. However, you are only required to give two possible answers. Okay, so question 2.1.1 and then 2.1.2 here. 
um, give two examples of leakages. I'm sure you guys were able to um, copy those answers as well as the types of business cycles. I'm going to put the next slide on with the next few questions. Um, so we can just run through those quickly. So the third question was to list any two uses of per capita income figures. Again, just a reminder that the mark allocation is two times one, meaning that you need to um, give two answers and each will be awarded one mark, okay? And these are any of the accepted answers, answers that will be accepted for this, for this question. So two uses, uses of per capita income figures. And just to go back, um, in order for a learner to answer this question, they would, you would need to know what per capita means. So normal per capita means per head or per person. So if we are saying per capita income, you are taking the GNI figures into account, the gross national income. So all income earned by the permanent residents of a country or all factors of production. And we divide that by the population. So the, the how many people are in a country. And this would give us a per capita income um, figure. So why would the government be interested in having these types of um, information or this type of information? So these are possible answers to indicate economic development because the higher the per capita income, the higher the standard of living of the citizens in a country. Okay? If we know what the per capita income levels, for example, if we take into account, um, we look at South Africa and compare South Africa with a developing, another developing country. Um, so for the second bullet, so to compare living standards, so we compare the standard of living in, let's say, South Africa and Zimbabwe, South Africa and Brazil, you know, countries that are sort of on the same um, level development-wise. So to compare um, those types of, of things. And it can also indicate your living standards, which goes hand in hand with the levels of poverty experienced in a certain country. Okay, so basically that's the importance of this type of information, like per capita income. Question four, name two examples of government expenditure. So here you, um, you basically list the types of things or the function, the, the, the expenditure functions of government. What does government spend money on in the economy? So um, they spend money on roads, you know, maintaining building roads, spend money on hospitals, on schools. Um, if you were to say spending on infrastructure, remember infrastructure doesn't necessarily only refer to your, your roads and your air, um, like harbors and etc. Et so it's a very broad term, be more specific. Say what, it, well, what you are referring to um, in more simpler, uh, simpler terms, like given on the screen, okay? So two of those would be would be um, marked. So each one of those, spending on roads, one tick. Spending on hospitals, one tick. Question five. Um, now the example, name any two major flow elements in the economy. So when we look, this is a question regarding the circular flow. So you have, a, a, when you think flows, the first thing you might think you are referring, we are referring to the money flow and the real flow. Um, that, however, yes, money flow is income and real flow would be production. However, when we do when we do GDP calculations, remember we have three methods of calculating GDP, and those are also referring to three different flows in the economy. So you have the production flow. So this is the flow of factors of production and the flow of goods and services in the economy. You have a flow of income. 
So it's immunization deceived by our factors of production, okay? Then we also have a flow of spending or a flow of expenditure. So what all the participants in the circular flow are spending in the economy. So any one of those two would be, ex oh, sorry, of those three would be accepted as answers there. Okay, so we are going to move on to question um, 2.1.2, 3.1.2, or 4.1.2 in um, section B. So I previously said, these are now you explain how, what, and why types of questions. Let's have a look at the questions. Okay, this is a typing error over here. Question two, what is the effect of a decrease in household disposable income on the marginal propensity to save? This should be one multiplied by two as well. So it means that you only give one statement or one fact, one sentence as, as an answer, which will be worth um, two marks. So we will try and do the first two together and the rest of them um, you can complete or go through, work through in your own time. Right, so, correct well for the first question. The question asks us, why is the GDP at market prices normally higher than the GDP at factor cost? Now, um, in order for, for you to be able to answer this question, you need to know which method of GDP calculation um, do we basically uh, come across where we have a line labeled GDP at market prices and then we have GDP at factor cost, right? So to me, if I look at factor cost, it already tells me this has got something to do with remuneration that is earned by the factors of production, which would be the income method, okay? Um, but besides the method, normally basic prices or factor cost, this is now when we the, the, the prices of um, goods and services in the economy without, before taking into account taxes. And in this case, the type of tax we are referring to would be our indirect taxes. So the answer to why GDP at market prices is normally higher than GDP at factor costs would be as follows. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. So GDP at market prices takes into account the prices that we actually pay for the goods and services. So the prices that you and I as a consumer, sorry, that we actually pay for those goods and services. And the price that we pay already includes indirect taxes. And the type of indirect tax that we pay is VAT. Okay? So we pay VAT at a rate of 15%. 
And that 15% is already included in the price of that product that we are buying. And that price that you as a consumer are paying is the market price. But GDP at factor cost doesn't include that 15% that yet. So that is why GDP at market price will be more than GDP at factor prices or at factor cost. So um, the second bullet over here says indirect taxes are added to GDP at factor cost to calculate GDP at market price, which makes GDP at market prices higher. So you will see these are two sentences. So either one of the two would be accepted as well as any other correct relevant response. So you are saying the same thing, it might not be in exactly the same words, but it, it, it comes down to the same thing where you are saying that GDP at factor cost does not include indirect taxes. Therefore, GDP at market prices, which includes the indirect taxes, will be higher than GDP at factor cost. So as long as it says the same thing, your answer will be marked as, as correct. The second question asks you, what is the effect of a decrease in the household disposable income on the marginal propensity to save? Okay, so when a question asks you, what is the effect? If something happens, so there's a, there's a decrease in the amount of disposable income that households have, um, and because of this, how is this going to impact the marginal propensity to save? So the effect is either going to be an increase or a decrease, or as we could also say, the effect is going to be um, a positive effect or a neg negative effect. Okay? So in terms of breaking down this question and correctly understanding or interpreting this question, if there's a decrease in household disposable income, so this means the household has less money available to spend. Okay. Now, after um, tax has been deducted, etc., there's less disposable income to spend in the economy. Now, if I have less disposable income, it stands to reason that I will have less to save or I will save less of my income. Okay, because I have less money available to spend. Because obviously savings is that portion of your income that you don't spend. And if I already have less money to spend in the economy, I'm going to have less money to, to save. Okay, so what is the effect? If I have less income, disposable income, so a decrease in household disposable income, so because I have less money to spend, will also reduce the level of saving. So I will save less money and the direct implication of this is that the MPS, the marginal propensity to save, will also be, um, so the size of the MPS will also be um, affected there. So your answer, a decrease in household disposable income, so my income has decreased, this will also reduce the amount of money that is being saved as well as the size of the MPS. Alternatively, you can also say it would be difficult for households to save. Thus, there will be lower levels of savings. Very straightforward, but the trick is, or for you, is to adapt your thinking in terms of if this happens, what is the result of it? So practical thinking, but also based on what you know. 
So you will have one sentence or one fact there. Again, um, we're looking at the mark allocation. So two marks for that one fact. Could I please have an indication if um, learners are okay with or have co copied this answer for these two questions? Um, and also, if we can move on to the next section. Remember I said I was just going to go through these two questions answers with you. The rest of them you can um, use for study purposes where you could look for the answers in your core notes or in your textbook, whatever resources you have available to you and will also help you with regards to preparation for the exams. Um, so I won't be going through these answers here for you. The interest of saving time, we have one hour left. We have still quite a bit to um, to work through. Okay, so. Um, when you are with busy with question paper, so like this is now section B, you have now decided to answer question 2, for example, and we now covered question 2.1.2 and 2.1.2. Um, then after this, so now you will have question 2.2 and 2.3 or 3.2, 3.3, 4.2 and 4.3. This will now be um, your dot response question. So this is where you will get that um, case study or the extract or an article or a figure or diagram for you to study and you will be asked some questions and the whole section will be worth 10 marks. What is important to note is that the questions may sometimes have very little to do with the extract, especially the first question. So you might have a graph given but it doesn't mean that that first question that is asked will be based on the graph or you'll find the answer in the graph or on the extract or you have to read and find it. It'll be whatever the case study is or whatever the illustration is given to you will give you a, a sort of an indication as to what the question is about. It might be about business cycles. It might be the circular flow. It might be foreign trade. Um, so you should then know that the rest of the questions will have to do with that specific topic, but not necessarily that your answers will be coming from the text, okay? So the extract or the picture that you're given, the cartoon, table, diagram, etc., is merely a means to give you context of the content covered, and this serves as an introduction to the topic or a stimulus, okay? So what will follow is just a little breakdown as to how the questions are structured for you. Now, um, the first question will be lower order. Okay, so question 2.1 or 2.3.1, um, the question numbers are over here in this column, right? So basically what it means is your first two questions will be lower order questions and these, as you can see, the mark allocation will be one mark. So maybe list, name, give, say, okay? So these questions, the answer to these questions may or may not come from the extract or the graph or the case study, whatever um, the dot response is. Candidates, please, this is very important, must give their answers in full questions, sorry, in full sentences. 
like I said, um, the first two questions, one mark. Following these, you will have uh, two more questions. So, um, so you'll have the extract at the top over there, and then you will have a question, first question, one mark, second question, one mark, and then after this, you will have two questions with a mark allocation of two. Um, it might not make sense what I'm saying right now, but I will move to a slide with an example to show you the mark allocation and the structure. So the two more questions are questions, you know, these are description type of questions. So basically it's testing your terminology. So once again, definitions come in very handy and it helps you a lot throughout the question paper. So candidates are normally expected to briefly describe a term or a concept and also you must um, reiterate, write your answers in full sentences. Then the second question, so the first one, 2.2.3, 3.2.3 um, or 4.2.3. So this will be a two more question and it would normally be a definition or description that, that is required. The question following that will um, will now go to a different cognitive level, so different level of difficulty. So this will be your how, why, what question. And these questions are normally your middle order cognitive questions. Now remember the first ones were your lower order questions, or lower order um, cognitive level, and this is your middle order cognitive questions. And these questions can include, but are not limited to, drawing of graphs, drawings, based on facts, etc. Then, so now we have had two questions, one mark each, and then two questions, two marks each. So that is one plus one, um, that's two plus two, it's four, plus the last two mark question, which is six marks, and then your last question for the 10 marks will be a four mark question. And this is your higher order um, cognitive levels. So these are also how, why, or what questions, higher order questions. And these questions require learners to evaluate, analyze, or examine, for example. So here, yes, I know the definition of it, but now I have to apply what I know to answer this question. Here, you must write your answers in full sentences, as well as um, you are required to give your own opinion. Um, but just highlighting that giving your own opinion or must be based on economic facts, what you know as the definition. So we're just testing your understanding of those um, concepts that you know. So many marks are lost because of the misinterpretation you don't completely understand what is required of you and so now you are answering wrong, giving the wrong answer or learners leave the question blank so they don't respond to it at all. So what do you do? Avoid the following when answering this question. Candidates must not list the answer. So this will only be awarded one mark. Now you give, or for example, you only give an example you will only be given one mark because you won't ask for examples of something. You will ask to apply your knowledge of that um, particular concept. Okay? If the example is explained in a full sentence, you will be then you will get two um, two marks. So it's not just listing an example; but you're actually explaining it, giving a more comprehensive response to the answer to the question. Now, um, the next section. We are specifically going to look at Section B questions related to specific topics. So the first topic now, so we're going to look at these 10 more questions and how it is typically asked in your exam. So the first one we will look at is the circular flow. Um, look, as Grade 12 learners, you've been exposed to this topic. We were first introduced to it in Grade 9 EMS when you did a basic circular flow. And in grade 10, you did it as well. Then each year, it's just something more was added. And so, um, 
I believe or I feel that you should be more comfortable with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Because <coughs> you've had three, four years exposure to this topic. So let's have a look. <coughs> Sorry. So this is a typical question. So now the questions instruction tells you, study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. So this is your diagram. This is now what is given as 2.2 or 2.3, your case study, your um, child response. Now based on this diagram, you will be asked some questions. So here you see, <coughs> sorry. So, we have our households over here, our participants, primary participants, most um, important participant in the circular flow, governments, <coughs> and our businesses. Um, it's important to note, so it might be that diagrams that you are used to, uh, you would have the various markets, right? So on this side would be our factor market, and over here, goods and services are available, but it doesn't explicitly say that these are the markets. The various interactions, the money flow, and um, the real flow between the participants. Let's have a look at typical questions. So, this is what your questions would look like, your 10 more question. Um, as we previously went through this, so your first two questions would be one mark each, then the next two, two more questions, and the last one, number five, would be your four more question. So you have a diagram in front of you. You will find this on page 10 of your learner workbook. Okay, so you have the diagram up in front of you as well as the questions. And the actual verbs have been highlighted for you so that they are in bold. So um, we're gonna go through this. Try and answer these questions. I'll give you some time. <coughs> Excuse me. To answer the questions and then we'll go through the answers. Okay, so right now. <coughs> let's just um, work through those answers quickly. So all of these are based on the circular flow and the questions obviously might not um, be directly on that diagram that was in that is in the paper. Um, but the fact that you see the circular flow there, you know that most of the questions following will be about the circular flow. So, <clears throat> first question for one mark, name the type of economy that is presented in the diagram above. Now this question refers to, let's have a look at the diagram again. So, what type of economy is this? So you can basically only see three of the participants, right? We know there's a fourth participant, and that fourth participant is the foreign sector. But based on the various flows here, we can see that the foreign sector is involved. And if a foreign sector is involved in the economy, that means that this is an open economy. <clears throat> and how do we know that the foreign sector is involved? Households are importing goods and services, and businesses over here or exporting. So this tells us that the foreign sector is involved in this economy. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we look at the answers, so name the type of economy presented in the diagram above, you would have simply just said that this was an open economy. The second question for one mark, identify one leakage in the above diagram. So any one of these three leakages taxes, savings, or imports, all three are present on the diagram. So any one of the three would be accepted, okay? Because you're only required to name one of them. Third question, what are the two types of flows found in the circular flow model? Now these flows we are referring to, we are referring to this. The, 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 the flow of income or expenses between the participants as well as of goods and services and factors of production.
So, there is a flow of goods and services or factors of production as well as a flow of income and expenses. And we have names for these two flows. It's the money flow or the real flow. Had you said remuneration, um, income and expenses or income and expense spending, that would have been accepted. And then the real flow, goods and services and factors of production. Okay, so this answer required was a market allocation of two. Now, do you see that it doesn't specify whether it's one multiplied by two or two multiplied by one? Um, but in the question, it asks you what are the two types of flows, so two answers were required. Okay. Question four explain the effect. So now you have to give an explanation. So this means a full sentence. Explain the effects of an increase in national income due to injections being higher than leakages. So, within the circular flow, there was an increase in national income, and this was as a result of injections being higher than leakages. So, more money <coughs> flowed into the circular flow than what left the circular flow. So, what will be the effects of this? Now, the fact that there's more or well, national income has increased, this means when national income increases, so the households or the people in the country um, have more money, which means demand will increase. So they will um, buy more goods and services, they will spend more in the economy because national income in general has increased. So demand will increase for the products in the country. And as a result of demand increasing, more has to be produced, which means production will increase, okay? And as a result of production increasing, because we need labor to produce these additional goods and services, therefore, greater, um, sorry, greater employment or more employment or more jobs will be created. Okay, so it has a ripple effect. Uh, more income, more demand, higher demand, and because there's a higher demand, more production has to take place to satisfy this demand, and as a result of this, more people will be employed. Okay? So, um, that is all of those effects in one sentence, and that gives you your two marks. So, this is your um, middle order cognitive level, right, type of question. Let's go to the last one. So um, remember the fifth question, the last one, that is for four marks. Um, so this is your higher order cognitive question. Now this question requires of you, it says, suggest ways, so you have to give suggestions, you have to propose or give recommendations to the South African government. So suggest ways that the South African government can use its policies to influence the amount of injections and leakages in the country in order to expand the economy. Sorry. Okay, so suggesting ways. So what type of policies are available to government? We've got our monetary and fiscal policies, okay, that the government can use to influence the flow of money coming into and money leaving the circular flow. But all of this has to be done so as to promote or to expand the economy for economic growth to take place. So how can we encourage, so how can the government encourage economic growth? So either they are going to reduce or lower the amount of leakages, right? So less money leaving the circular flow, or increase the amount of money entering the circular flow. So less money leaving, more money coming in. How can this be facilitated? So the government could also bear in mind, these are all, possible, all the possible um, ways to answer the question. So either you're gonna say, you are going to list some ways that the government can increase injections, or you are going to list some ways where they can decrease um, the, the leakages. Remember, it's only four marks. So basically, 
two full sentences or two facts that are given. Okay. If you want to give a combination of both, um, that would also be accepted because you are basically giving one way that injections can be increased and you are also supplying the way that um, leakages could be decreased or lowered. <coughs> so how can the government increase injections? So if government increases their spending in the economy, okay, so if government spends more, there's more money coming into the economy. Um, government would also encourage exports by relaxing regulations. So encouraging exports. So domestic businesses, so the businesses within South Africa, we want them to sell to foreign markets. So exporting goods, South African made goods and services to the foreign sector. And it might be that there's too, many, too much red tape or too much um, regulations you know, with regards to um, exporting. So if government relaxes those regulations, it makes it easier for those companies to export. And the fact that they are exporting, or South Africa is exporting more, makes us less reliant on imports. And this will also be, in exchange for those exports, we have to be paid, so it's money coming into the circular flow, okay? Third way is to motivate households to invest by lowering interest rates. Okay, so we want capital formation to take place, whether it's by individuals or by firms, etc., in the South African economy. So the only way this will take place is if um, we have lower interest rates. Now, what are interest rates? We first need to know what are interest rates. <coughs> Pardon? So interest rates, if I go to the bank, I approach a venture capitalist, I approach a bank, a financial institution, for money, for funding, to make a loan, um, it might be to start up my own business, etc. So the interest rate is the amount that you pay back on the borrowed funds. Okay. Now if those interest rates are low, it means I spend less money on that expense. There's less expenditure for myself, which means my profits are more, or my disposable income is more, which I now can invest in turn, invest into the economy. Okay. Then, on the other hand, so that all, those are ways the government can increase injections. But government can also look at lowering leakages or decreasing the amount of money leaving the circular flow. How can they do this? By reducing household savings through monetary policy. This is basically you want your household to save less and spend more. That's contradictory to what we just um, discussed now. Um, but remember, savings is that portion of your income that you don't spend. So the money is not being utilized in the economy. So we want people now to save less and to spend more, and that way you stimulate um, demand and economic growth can take place. Also, <coughs> excuse me, lower the taxes. If households and businesses are paying less tax, it means they have more money to spend, more disposable income. And this means less money is leaving the circular flow. <coughs> the money is staying in the economy, in the country, and it's being spent and used in the country. The third one here, using fiscal policy to limit or discourage importation. Okay, so using fiscal policy now, there's a difference. We've now mentioned monetary policy, which has to do with the supply of money. And this is regulated by the South African Reserve Bank, which is monetary policy. Fiscal policy has got to do with tax. Okay, um, and the institute that regulates this would be the South African Revenue Services. <clears throat> so, using fiscal policy, so taxation, as a way to limit or discourage people from importing. How is this a way of decreasing leakages? Um, so, customs duties, excise duties, those types of taxes are levied on imports. So, 
I go online, for example, as, as a consumer, and instead of buying from a domestic or South African company, I order something online from a uh, foreign company. It means this is now entering our borders and the money that I pay for that product is leaving South Africa, leaving the circular flow. But if I had to pay a certain amount to get the product into South Africa, it might discourage me because it's going to make it more difficult for me and more expensive for me to buy this product if the product is available locally. Okay, So um, taxes can be used as a way to lower or decrease leakages. <clears throat> so um, if we look back at this question, all of it had to do with the circular flow, but not necessarily that I would have found the answers in the diagram. Okay, So that would have been a, that's a total of 10 marks. The first two we did, question 2.1.1, um, 2.1.2 was a two marks, two marks, which was four marks, and now we did a 10 mark question. Now your section B question, let's say this was now question two that you're answering. This is only the first section of it. There would be a 2.3 or a 3.2 or a 4.2 now as well. We would find another case study or, or article or diagram also for 10 marks that you have to answer but won't necessarily be on the same topic. Okay, so it could be any one of those subtopics would be the next section. So we're going to move on to um, the second portion or the second part of it. And the next question will be about national accounts. So here we are going to do a bit of calculations. Hope that you brought your calculators along. Remember, whenever you're writing an economics exam, you have to have um, be prepared because there's normally some calculations involved and you do need your calculator for this. So this second question will also be data responses, also for 10 marks, with the same structure. Okay, let's have a look. This you will find on page 11 of your learner workbook. We have about 20 minutes left. Let's make the most of it. <clears throat> so the national accounts, what if I see national accounts? <clears throat> I'm thinking I'm going to have to be doing some calculations here because it's GDP calculations, etc. Right. So the question reads as follows. Study the table below and answer the questions that follow. So now I'm going to look at the table. The first column over here. Gross value added by kind of economic activity. Okay, this is an area, so it's 2019 to 2020. So it's for one financial year, one fiscal year. Um, these are official figures. The source is the um, South African Reserve Bank's bulletins. So these are actual figures from the government regarding um, trade, you know, and production in South Africa. <coughs> so. These are the types of economic activities, and now you have to be in mind also, we have different types of economic activity, and it's classified by the economic sector that it takes place in. So the three economic sectors, um, the primary sector, secondary sector, and tertiary sector. So all of these are taking place in one of those sectors that's not specifying which sector. The second column are the figures for the year 2019, and then the second column of the figures for the year, financial year 2020, right? <clears throat> so you will now also have five questions to answer, and these will be based on just the information given here, but in general about national accounts and GDP calculations, etc. So let's have a look at the questions. Okay, now before we go to the questions, so we have agriculture, forestry, and fishing. Already you ask yourself, what economic sector is this? Mining and quarrying, wholesale and retail trade, catering and accommodation, manufacturing, transport, storage and communication. So these are the various types of economic um, activity. And let's see what questions are. <coughs> so, 
Again, mark allocations, have a look. You have your two one more questions, then you have your two two more questions, and your higher order, which is the four more question. So the first question. Which method was used in the calculation of the gross domestic product, GDP, above? Um, grade 12, I'm going to give you a few minutes for you to um, attempt answering these questions and then we will go through the answers together. If you have any questions, please feel free, raise a hand and you may direct your questions at me and I'll attempt to answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, <clears throat> great one. So let's work through these answers on national accounts. So first question, which method was used in the calculation of the GDP or gross domestic product above? Um, before I gave you the opportunity, I actually gave you a hint over there because I said if we go back, um, if we look at the various economic activities, by knowing your economic sectors, you would have been able to ascertain <coughs> which economic sector this economic activity falls under. And if we're looking at um, production by various economic sectors, that indicates that the method used would be the production method. Because we are looking at production taking place, within the primary sector, second big sector, and tertiary sector, because all of those um, economic activities could have been classified per economic sector, okay? So the method used, we have three methods um, to calculate GDP, which would be our production method, income method, and expenditure method. But because we are looking, we are looking at the economic activity of the various economic sectors, that indicates the production method was the method that was used. Second question, also for one mark. List one aggregate measure of economic activity. So basically, why do we have to measure economic activity? This question you might have um, misinterpreted. Okay, so it's basically why do we measure aggregate economic activity? Um, and if we use the word aggregate, we are referring to the sum of the whole country, right? Um, all citizens of this country. So one measure of it would be to determine the standard of living within a country, to compare prosperity levels between countries, because if we know what the standard of living in country A is, um, we can compare it to the standard of living in country B. And it also measures economic growth on a year-to-year -year basis. So any one of these um, would have been an answer. So how are we going to know that economic growth took place within the country? So obviously you're going to measure 2018, you're going to compare to 2019's economic growth or um, production capacity of a country. Okay, so any one of those for one answer. The next question. Briefly describe the term gross domestic product. So here you had to give a definition of what GDP is. So what is gross domestic product? The value of all final goods and services that's produced within the borders of a country within a specific period, which is normally a year. Okay? Um, I trust, believe that um, this definition, everyone, Got that right, okay? Um, because we've been dealing with this every year, and I said at the beginning of the session that if you know your definitions, it makes it easier for you to answer certain question to answer questions throughout the question paper. So let's move on. So that was the first two more question. You just very straightforward. You had to give a definition. The next question, explain the purpose of the system of national accounts. Um, so basically, why do we use the SLA, the system of national accounts? So the purpose of it is to provide an integrated, complete system of accounts 
to provide an integrated, complete system of accounts enabling international comparisons of all significant economic activity. You would have find, found, um, you'll find this answer in your textbook, in your core notes, if you have a mind the gap um, study guide as well, under your concepts, okay, definitions. So for two marks as well, a full sentence. Then the last question for four marks was a calculation that was required of you. So you now had to calculate because what was given in um, the table of figures were just the figures for each economic activity. Nothing had been calculated or um, taken any further there. So you have to calculate the gross value added at basic prices for the year 2020. Now, remember, we go back. We were given two years, but the year in question, or what the question specifically wants, is for you to do the calculation for the year 2020. Now, how do I go about doing this? So, all the figures were given to you for the year 2020. Let's just go back quickly. Um, you had no need to group it into economic sectors, for example. Um, so by, this is a very straightforward calculation. Bear in mind, it's the year 2020 and not 2019. So had you taken use these figures, it would be incorrect, even though the operation that you conducted was correct, but you used the wrong figures, the question said 2020. Let's have a look. How do we calculate this? So I'm just going to switch screens. We look at the calculation. <coughs> okay, so what I did here was I actually listed um, the economic activities and 2020, that's the year that we are supposed to take into account, right? So for 2020, agriculture, forestry, and fishing, 69,049. Mining and quarrying, 226,154. Excuse my handwriting. Wholesale and retail trade, etc., was 431, 720, manufacturing, 383, 831, and then the last item was the transport, storage, and communication, which was 272, 179. So you add all of these up. Okay. Which would have given you a final total. So this is where our calculator comes into play of 1,380,933 rands. Okay. Your final answer, or if you hadn't written all of these down, you would have just said 69,049 plus 226. 154 plus 431, 720 plus 3, 3 <coughs> 831 plus 272, 179, which would have given you that total, 382933 for four marks. Okay. Fairly straightforward, just that to know what was required or where to look. Okay, okay. so calculate gross value added at basic prices for the year 2020. My apologies, this would have been GVA. Gross value added at basic prices. Just to show you. So I just neglected to um, put in the labeling over here. Okay that the final total is the gross value added at basic prices, or if you did this way, GVA at basic prices, and that was the final total.
Okay. No questions coming through, so I'm assuming everyone um, is on the same page as my as with me. And we could continue. Let's see. Oops, it's one o'clock. We've come to the end of our session, people. Um, so we've managed to cover two subtopics, which was um, the circular flow and national accounts. When we continue on Tuesday, uh, Thursday, sorry, we'll pick up with the multiplier and business cycles. And there's quite a bit, there's still the public sector and international trade um, to cover. We'll see how far we get with that. So thank you um, for attending and participation. And I'll see you on Thursday. Goodbye.